All right, everyone. We're about to start. Uh, Mr. Nir Simonovich. Did I pronounce your last name right? It's okay. I've known you for like, what, 15 years? 20 years or something? And I've read your, okay. We're about to, we're about to hear a presentation by Nir about some, some more things that you can do with Asterisk. Um, and uh, Nir, I guess, is a little background. He's actually worked on Asterisk itself. He's submitted patches to it and many contributions. And so uh, he's got very solid technical grounding. Like uh, he's somebody that uh, sometimes I, I, you know, I ask questions about different things too. And uh, grateful that uh, he's, he's here today and time is yours, Nir. Okay. What happened to the old mics that we put on our shirts? Like, what? Um, um, how many of you in the past ever been to one of my presentations? I admit I hadn't presented at Astrocon or any of these conferences about five years now. Any of you? But hands up. Well, Duffet, of course. You know. So everybody's new. Okay. So I have I have this a uh, little bit of a shtick. Sorry. I, I'm sorry. Not, so I have a little bit of a shtick, and that is I need your participation during the talk, okay? That means that I will be asking questions. They will not be rhetorical. I do expect people to answer them. It's kind of, you know, I'm standing up here, and it's a little bit boring at sometimes, so you'll have to make it interesting for me. Um, so anybody who participates, there is a whole bunk, bunch of candies around here. You're going to get them thrown at you. If I hit you, it's okay. If I don't, it's also okay. I'm a, I'm a horrible shot. Yeah. Sorry? Uh, Tootsie Rolls, you're all a bunch of stuff here. <laughs> I have no idea. Whatever comes out, that's what you get. <laughs> okay. Um, so what are we going to talk about? Come on. Uh, so we're going to talk about doing more with Asterisk. And so all of you here are probably using Asterisk in one way or another. Who's using it? Asterisk only as a PBX. Raise your hands. Who is doing custom dev on Asterisk and creating weird shit? <laughs> Raise your hand. And who has no idea what they're doing with Asterisk? Raise your hand. <laughs> OK, that's a horrible, you know. What are you doing here? No, I'm kidding. So Asterisk is, so I've been working with Asterisk since about 2001. It was a long time. And I've done. If there's something that can be done with Asterisk, there's a good chance I've already done it. Uh, routing, IVRs, speech recognition, you name it. I wrote libraries for Asterisk, I wrote books on Asterisk. And as time progressed, I realized that Asterisk, as much as I love it, and it really is one of the best tools you can find out there, not only from a technical standpoint, but also from a community standpoint. The community is very vibrant and likes sharing is that in many situations, it's hard, really hard to do really complex stuff. And sometimes even doing the simple stuff is hard because there are so many ways of doing it. How many of the people here know how to write extensions.conf file? How many of you ever used Lua? One, two. How many of you used AEL? One, two. So there are two other technologies inside Asterisk that are far superior to extensions, and yet nobody uses them. Why is that? Because they're not that approachable. So a little bit about myself. Uh, I've been an Asterisk VoIP developer since 2001. As I said, that means I've been doing this stuff for about 23 years. Uh, prior to that, I was doing all sorts of stuff. Let's not dwell into that. Uh, today, I'm the CEO and founder of Cloudonix. Cloudonix is a carrier agnostic CPaaS, or how we like to refer to it as software-defined communications platform. I'll explain what that is in a few seconds. Um, I see myself a bit of a, as a mad scientist. I like creating things that are weird uh, and creating mashups of things that normally don't mash up. Uh, a little bit, as I said, about Cloudonix from a uh, Let's say technical standpoint, it is a next generation CPaaS. It means that we provide you with 
APIs and capabilities of creating call flows and creating all kinds of voice applications, et cetera, in a very easy to use manner. From a business perspective, it basically makes communications life easier. It enables businesses to do more. Today, our customers are spanning from large media companies like Nickelodeon and Viacom and all the way through startups and communication services and you name it. So this presentation is a little different because unlike the previous one when you saw, where you saw a terminal with a lot of commands, I'm going to show you some, some other tools, various cloud services that you can use in a very simple manner to create new experiences. And we're going to go through it step by step in order to be incredibly, let's say, I don't want to say simplistic, but in order to convey how simple it is to take your Astra server and bring new life to it in a simple manner. So let's start talking about tech. If we're talking about the future, so today we're talking about, if you're looking at contact centers, we're looking at businesses, we're talking about 80, 90% human operated, 10% AI operated. This is where we are today. And we're starting to see AI moving forward in time. We're starting to see these integrations. We start, we're talking about transcription. We're talking about uh, generative AI. And some, let's say, some predictions say that by the year 2030, we will no longer have human contact center operators. They will all be replaced by AI, by generative AI tools. And these tools, are a little bit, uh, how should I say it, alien to the normal people that use asterisk and build things on asterisk. How many of you know how to properly prompt ChatGPT? One person. Okay, my friend, because you stand up so I can see you, unfortunately I can't see anything beyond like one meter ahead, so if I hit, oops, sorry. <laughs> I'll do it again. Hopefully I'll get to that place. Well, Tootsie Rolls don't fly that good. Managed to get it a little further. So I got a question for you, OK? How well can you define a prompt to chat GPT okay, to perform customer care? How long will it take you? A long time. Why will it take, why will it take you a long time? So training these language models becomes a problem. And that realm of training is alien to most Asterisk users and Asterisk people. And doing these integrations become non-trivial. Now, so that is the world of AI, right? Now let's have a look at Asterisk. So in the early days, you know, things were very much synchronous. We, we had AGI, we had AMI, they, they were great, I love them. How many of you still use AMI? So a good percent. How many of you use only ARI? One, two. My God. Josh, we're doing something wrong. If only two people are hand, hands up with the, using only ARI, we're definitely doing something wrong. Would you like to find a, lo a very long pole to hang you from? Huh? <laughs> So Asterisk is really great, and it provides you a lot of APIs and a lot of ways to do things, but the truth is that it still lacks some of the tools or capabilities that you want it to have. Everything is done externally. Even ARI brings a lot of things to the table, but you still need to do a lot of work to get it to do what you want. External media, you want to do transcription, you want to do live things. Things become complicated. Um, things that normally in the dial plan will be like just one line of dial plan in ARI become like 150 lines of code. <laughs> How many of you have done that and got frustrated by that? Right? Annoying. But this is reality. Now, <clears throat> it doesn't really have to be like that. Now, there are ways to work with asterisk and provide the primitives and the things that you need 
to do, not necessarily just inside asterisk, but also outside of asterisk, and then return the control back to asterisk itself. What does that mean? It means that sometimes it will be easier to have a call coming into asterisk from anywhere in the world, have it being serviced by a third party or an external system, and then return control back to asterisk in some manner. In many cases, that weird transaction, that weird call flow concept makes life really easy. And let's stop talking about ideas. Let's talk about basically what you need to do. What tools can we use? So the first one that we're going to talk about is basically I'm going to show how it's done. I'm going to ex show you examples how we do it on, with our platform. By the way, what you will see right now that says Cloudonix, you can replace with Twilio, Plivo, any other tool that you want out there that is capable of doing stuff. Okay, It doesn't really matter. Uh, another tool which I'm incredibly surprised that nobody here heard of is called Make. Uh, make is, uh, anybody know what this is? Make, make.com? One person. So Make is effectively Zapier on steroids. Imagine an online no-code tool that enables your integration with over 1,600 different platforms out there, including ChatGPT, Google Speech, whatever you want, and Airtable. I'm confident people are familiar with Airtable, yeah? Anybody uses Airtable? What do you use that table for? Some back office operation. Another hand in the back. What? Who, who else? Yeah. What do you use Airtable for? Awesome. What if I told you that Airtable can be an automatic dialer? No. That doesn't make sense, right? Why would it take Airtable and use it as an automatic dialer? That's kind of silly, right? But it's doable. It's actually quite fun. So, so what do we do? So first thing, we need to have our CPaaS platform connect to our Office PBX. Now, bear in mind that I'm not telling you to do a rip and replace. Never. This is anybody who's ever been to my talks over the past, I know. 15 years, I do not believe in rip and replace. I believe rip and replace is the worst thing people can do. And the reason is very simple, because people, businesses, have their existing workflows, and they're good. They're working well for them. They're making money. If they're not, they would have closed shop, right? How many of you got into, into a business to try and sell them something, and the guy told, no, 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 it works just well. I, I don't want to hear about it. Forget it. I'm not going to buy it. Raise your hands. One, two, three. So it happens. How many of you got into a business and said, okay, I'm going to sell you something, but you need that little bit, you know? No, it's archaic. You don't need it. But businesses don't work like that. So the idea here is that you can connect anything that is SIP compliant into the platform. Calls can flow in, can flow out as much as you want. You can route them in the way you want them. You can add SIP headers. You can remove SIP headers. You can basically do whatever you want with a SIP trunk. Same concept you will do on an Astra server. From a lot of the platform's capabilities and, let's say, way of doing things are derived from how Astra works inside the SIP realms. <clears throat> Once we do that, we need to validate. Now, as you may see, how many of you have ever used Twilio? Awesome. So basically, inside the platform, there is something we call a container application engine. You can literally go in and write small CXML type applications or even JavaScript and Ruby that will be run inside our platform. You don't even need your own server. And you can create something really simple just to answer the call, to see that your interconnect works. That's it. Nothing more than that. You need to go out and set up your API key. Now, API keys are highly important. And one of the biggest mistakes that we've seen, at least, with most CPaaS platforms, that they do not provide the proper granular 
visibility or granular security levels. That means that you have one API key and it is kind of like the Lord of the Rings, one ring to ring them all, to, uh, to rule them all. So it's one API key for everything. Uh, we don't believe in that model. So in Cloudonix, you have special API keys for special functions. So for example, one are API, API keys for applications, one are for domains and so on. Each one's a little different. I'll be happy to go into it in more detail. Once you have that, you need a domain. What is a domain? Now, a domain is effectively, if you're familiar with Twilio, a domain will be a project or on SignalWire, okay? Uh, on other platforms, it could be, I don't recall the exact terminology on Plivo. But the idea is basically it's an isolated logical unit inside our environment that says, this is it. Whatever happens in here does not go anywhere else. So if your asterisk PBX works and connected to a specific domain, that's it. It will not go further from there. So make. Now make is a different platform. It is a drag and drop environment that enables you to create scenarios, workflow scenarios. Scenarios can be as, con as simple as two steps or as complex as 600 steps. I've created a scenario on make. So um, there is, I'll show you at the end of it, there's a, um, a demonstration of a voice AI bot that works on top of make. And basically that scenario right now has over 680 different modules connected to it in terms of steps inside the scenario. So the idea here is that you set up, once you have set up your CPaaS account, regardless of what CPaaS that is, you're now able to come in into make and start creating your scenario. In our case, basically I'm uh, creating a connector into our platform. The connector will create the application endpoint automatically for you. You don't need to go back and forth once the API key is defined. Once I, I clicked on save, basically the application will be defined inside the CPaaS platform automatically with some levels of profile that tells the platform what it is. There are various types of applications, the various types of interconnects and endpoints. I won't go into that. There's a lot more to see. The obligatory hello world. So how many of you, okay, so here's an interesting question, okay? How many of you get a kick from installing Asterisk, calling it from any, and, and listening to the demo congrats message for the first time? Okay, on every installation, please, raise your hands and don't be shy because we've all done it. Oh, you're using TT Monkeys, okay, fine. TT, so you, you prefer TT Monkeys? Okay, awesome. I'll tell, I'll tell Allison. I, I am, Hope she won't be insulted for that. <laughs> so, yeah. So this is what a, a hello world will look like. Basically, you will have one step. <clears throat> um, so let's see, is this working? Yeah, I'll go down here. So you will have one step basically here that accepts the webhook. This is basically the request coming from our platform into make. Then you say, okay, pl play a remote audio and return back the response. Now the call that goes into our platform can come from anywhere. It can come from your PBX. It can come from a carrier. It can come from a set of PBXs or even an extension that you had configured on your PBX to dial something specific on our side. You can even go about and say, okay, I'm gonna create a subscriber and have my PBX register on Cloudonics and behave as an extension or what we, call, what we refer to as a subscriber. <clears throat> so playing back a remote, a remote audio is quite simple. The only thing you need to do is say, okay, I just need to put the remote audio URL where it is and what happens after the, the actual playback has completed. I can always say, okay, go do this. After this is done, continue here, continue there. Now, the beautiful part, in, part of using Make, and this is why I like uh, using it a lot for it, specifically what I want to do, a fast-paced POC. So when it comes to building all kinds of proof of concepts, Make is an awesome tool. Why? Because I'm able to experiment with call flows quite rapidly 
without changing anything in my infrastructure. I don't need to bring in anything. I don't need more libraries. I don't need anything. Just, just to go in and out. And for example, one of the things that you're able to do is to use a single scenario to do everything. I'm going to show you how it's done afterwards. <clears throat> so, OK, so playing back a message is quite simple, right? There's nothing much to do with it, and it's not really useful. So let's talk about getting some input. So how do I get input? In order to get input into Make, basically, I need to use something called, as funny as it sounds, this is called a router module. <laughs> it's a horrible name, right? <laughs> Why is it called a router module? Because basically, you get into the module, and then every branch, you can put a condition saying, if the condition met on the input, go this, to this branch of the router. And the router can have hundreds of branches, as many as you want. Uh, here comes something interesting. So when working with make, if you want to make sure that your scenarios always come back to the same place, you need to make sure that the next step points to the same endpoint of your scenario potentially with some kind of input to say you need to go into this branch, and so on. Again, we go in, same kind of concept, and I missed, oh crap. I wrote DTMF input, but didn't put the right slide. How silly is that? Nobody caught that. Um, basically, DTMF input, you'll be able to say, how many keys you're looking for, what is the end keystroke. If you want to play back a message before the keystrokes, while being keystroked, and so on, you can do that. You can even create a situation today, so there's another tool which is uh, enabling you to record a message while playing back a message. Kind of like a text-to-speech bidirectional thing. So here we go. Let's record some data. So what we're going to do here, this concept, this scenario basically takes a single DTMF input and will register it into Airtable. So you can see that I'm using an Airtable module here that adds a line into my Airtable. Now, previously I said that you can use Airtable as an automatic dialer, right? How will I do that? So make, apart from being able to respond to webhooks, you're able to run periodic jobs, like every 60 seconds. So you can literally have a make to, uh, an air table that gets leads into it one by one, and then runs every minute and processes them and says, OK, I'm going to call this person. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. We actually have a customer doing it. They process about, today, 9,000 calls on a daily basis using Airtable. So the guy has no servers, nothing. Everything was done using Airtable, Make. Uh, he's also using Pipedream and Google Sheets. And he runs a full-blown fintech company on that. 60 agents are working on that. How crazy is that? Um, yeah. So Airtable, if you're not familiar, it's basically Excel on steroids. So uh, how many of you, you said that you're using uh, Airtable? I really recommend using it. Another tool, anybody know what Retool is? Familiar with Retool? It's pretty cool. Retool is a no-code environment for creating UIs that hook up into other systems to bring in data. Like if you want to create dashboards and all kinds of stuff like that, use Retool. Uh, you don't need fancy dashboard software. You can do it in like five minutes. Really simple to do. Uh, let's go wild. Now, what does it mean going wild? So previously you said that as technology progresses, you know something, I've got, I've got a bit of a question. How many of you are using generative AI? Who's using generative AI, AI today? One person, same person that knows how to prompt chat GPT. Is there another person apart from the cameraman? <laughs> oh, uh, you mean you, you want a piece of candy, is that right? Okay. <laughs> wow, stuff is buried in here. Um, so I'm gonna, okay, so cameraman, you're, 
Take to the, take to the right side so I can throw at you. Whoop. Here we go. Uh, so who's, you said you're using uh, generative AI. I saw another hand previously. So anybody else? Who's using Gen AI? Gen AI, okay, and at the back. What do you do with Gen AI? Whoop. I'm getting better. <laughs> so what do you do with it? Awesome. So we have a scenario, collection agency that uses generative AI to call somebody and, you know, get them to pay what they need to pay. Uh, in other scenarios, this would be considered robocalling, no? <laughs> That's a nice way to describe a robocall, right? The only thing that says, you owe us money. But who are you? I don't know. It doesn't matter. You owe us money, right? No, I'm kidding. Uh, anybody else doing something interesting with Gen AI? How come? How come are you guys not doing? Oh, we got one person. What are you doing with Gen AI? Oh. What? Transcriber kind. So what you're doing is basically post-mortem. It's a post-mortem call. So you're saying I'm recording everything, and then I, I'm, I'm, I'll deduce the action items, I'll deduce you know, the bullet points and so on, and that is the value. So these are awesome ways. These are often awesome things. But you noticed something interesting about these two? They are incredibly segmented. It means that in that case where we have a collection agency, the generative AI has been created in such a way that will facilitate a specific call flow and a specific knowledge. And in that case, the Gen AI isn't even there. It only analyzes and generates data based upon this, the language model. And these are valid use cases and they're extremely important. But as we progress in time, and the way Gen AI progresses is about five times faster than any other technology I've seen up till now. I'm saying in, over the next year, it's going to be 10 times faster. Is that we're reaching a point where Gen AI is going to be almost autonomous, almost self-sufficient. You won't need to teach it a scenario. You will only need to teach it who it is and what is its purpose. Okay, and this is the challenge that we all, as telecommunication engineers, will be facing. Because customers will come to us saying, hey, I want my first level triage to be a bot. And the guy says, and you say, okay, so bring me all your data so I can train your bot. And the guy goes, nah not going to give you anything because I don't have it. Most companies don't have any data, right? How many businesses have you met, like even large-scale businesses that have very well-orchestrated data sources for their triage process? Zip. Unless they're like billion-dollar companies. Most of them have no freaking idea. They train from one agent to another. They have no proper knowledge base and no proper knowledge transfer. And Gen AI will need to accommodate for that. It basically means that Gen AI will need to become the next agent. It will need to sit down and learn, understand, and deduce, and assert on its own. What you're seeing on the display right hand, this is a voice AI scenario. This is what it was actually two weeks ago. Right now it's far more elaborate because we added new capabilities. Um, you can call this and, and talk to her. Really, so write down a phone number. Okay, everybody pick up, okay, 805-4-10-10-10. Don't dial it now. Okay, 
because she is interesting, I admit it. She's also a little cheeky, and she tends to be uh, a little bit too full of herself. So don't be alarmed. And don't ask her for uh, you know, better pricing or something like that because she won't know what you want to talk to her about. Like, she doesn't do that. It's, it's designed to be a corporate receptionist. So you can answer, she can answer very specific questions. But the way that this is built is not using a language model. It's actually built on Google Sheets. So this entire voice AI feeds off a Google Sheet that has various topics and various descriptions related to that topic. And it deduces and asserts the actual answer that you are looking for on its own. Up till now, out of 98%, I would say 98%, it is accurate. 98% of the times, the answer is spot on. Uh, we actually had a case because, so every time, uh, every, uh, every interaction is logged. So we see the actual conversation of the person talking and what happened. Uh, we actually had one person trying to invite her to a date. And we actually changed the, uh, the preamble message saying, this is the AI receptionist. So, because it was really funny. It was for 25 minutes, he was talking to her, trying to get her on a date. It was really, it was amusing. So let's talk about a little bit predictions. What do you, what do you think our future is going to look like? This is not a rhetorical question, like, really. What do you believe is going to, our future is going to look like in five years from now? Nobody? Really? Yeah. You picked up your hand? Yeah. yeah. What do you think? Okay, so what you're saying is that as we progress, okay, what you're saying is that we're going to see communications going from the non-contextual, from the transactional, to the contextual. Right. So, in that case, I'm going to I'm going to ask you a different question. If that is the case, okay, if we're now if a, if an enterprise can create a, a an entity, okay, okay, that has visibility of all data inside the corporate data structure, then what use is an omni-channel tool? Chat with everything, or email, and yes. But here's the interesting question. You raised a very interesting topic, omnichannel. Today, omnichannel, for me personally, as I see it, is the milking cow of this industry. Why? Because every two years we have a new channel. First it was voice, then it was SMS, then it was Facebook, Twitter, then we had Snapchat, Ch uh, TikTok, WeChat, well, Telegram, whatever you want. How many channels do you believe will be? How many channels do you believe will be in the metaverse? I don't know, it depends. But look at this use case. Imagine that you are calling a company and say, hey, I'm requesting an invoice, right? this invoice. And if you have all the information centralized, and if you already send the invoice by email, the virtual agent will say, I send you the email, with one email with that invoice. Is not that invoice? You know, it's more human, you know, interaction with the exactly. client. Exactly. 
That's exactly the point. My friend, you d definitely deserve another one because that is where we're aiming for, that human connection. Human beings like connecting with human beings. This is the truth. And omni-channel services, as more as we do them today, they are inhuman. They prevent that connection between two people. AI and generative AI will enable us to create an initial connection that seems human. Yes. Thank you for... Wow, good. My answer is specific to the vertical that I'm in is in hospitality. Awesome. In hospitality, there's a massive trend right now to get away from that human interaction. Oh, now I understand who I'm talking to. Great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I'm not see I, I can't see that far. So fine. <laughs> okay. But, but the, the voice, I... <laughs> Better? Yeah. No, no, it's okay. <laughs> so in hospitality, all of you guys booked hotel rooms. Which one of you actually talked to a human to book a hotel room? And most of us are now either the Marriott app or the Hilton app, and we have the digital key. We don't even need to check in. It's all on the app. And when we leave the room, how many of us even bother to tell the front desk that we're checked out? Or we just hit a key. So combine that with a cultural trend of my 16, 17, 18-year-old kid who does not want to talk to even their friends. They just want to WhatsApp, and they're sitting literally next to each other at the restaurant. And they're texting back and forth and having fun. So I see what's the future, to answer your original question. 80%, if not, 80% of the communication is going to be text-based. doesn't matter what channel, WhatsApp, Telegram, no, they're all the same. Text-based, 20% voice. And as the baby boomers die and all of us get older, it's going to be less and less and less. Wow. What a bleak future that is. It's happening right now. Well, if I want to talk to my daughter, I text her because if I call her, she won't right. answer the phone. You know, I second that. you second that. How many, how many people believe that is true? Sadly. Wow, sadly. Okay. I'm happy to tell you that you're wrong. And I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. I also had that particular experience. I have two daughters. Okay, uh, one of them is now going to be 15. The other one is now just turned 13 a couple months ago. Um, you're right. Teenagers, the, the, our current generation, they're more into texting. They're more into this immediate response. Um, the thing is, that what I've noticed, and this is something that I've seen over the years, is that as we grow older, voice becomes more, fa more uh, the dominant. Number two, nobody will do a $50,000 deal over a text message. They will fucking pick up the phone because they want to make sure there's somebody on the other side they can bitch slap when something goes wrong. Right? Dude, I'll tell you this, only in the U.S. You come to Israel, you can't buy a Tesla online. Yeah. Yeah. So, a few predictions. So, conversational AI is here. It's here to stay. It will become better as we progress. It's getting better almost on a daily basis. So, our chatbot was originally based on ChatGPT 3.5. Yesterday, they uh, opened up the API to GPT 4 publicly on, on the platform, and psh, that's it. I moved to four and became smarter. Um, still has some mileage to go. Generative AI is interesting. It is scary sometimes, I have to admit. Uh, it can do some really wacky things if you don't know how to control it. But it is definitely going to remain with us for many, many, many years because it is the future. Uh, no-code environments such as Make, Zapier, Pipe Dream, and so on should become your go-to solution for building new capabilities. I'm not telling you you should use our platform, you should use that platform as a concept. No-code capabilities enable you to design your workflows and after the workflow works, you can decide if you want to migrate to a proper done, probably done, you know, 
server code that you write yourself or have a developer develop it or just stay with that no code working, you know. There are a lot of companies using no code as their infrastructure. You had a question? You had a question? Sorry. Oh, I, thought you were, I thought you raised your hand. Sorry. Um, a single platform is no longer enough. Sorry to say, everybody is out there, and I'm seeing yesterday there was a CPaaS panel, uh, and everybody's like pushing to a one platform for everything. We will do your integrations, we'll do your voice, your contact center, you cast your CPaaS, whatever. No, impossible. If, imp it's impossible to do. If somebody tells me that his platform does everything, and yeah, it does everything really bad. Okay, you can do one thing awesome, or you can do everything like shit. And this is something you need to remember, and that means that you as asterisk users, developers, integrators, need, not need, but have to go about outside of your current existing comfort zone and I'm going to recite Josh. Imagine that he's going to deprecate the dial plan. Right? Okay. Okay. So start looking at things from a new perspective. Beyond the synchronous way that we think as telephony people. Telephony people think in a synchronous, linear manner. This is why most telephony people look at ARI and say, what the, I don't get it. Doesn't make any sense to me. Because it's the exact opposite of how telephony people think, right? This is why it's a little bit alien. And always remember that as long as, as we progress forward, the world will require more generalized solutions, not only a shrink wrap to do just one vertical or just one segment. It will become more generalized, specifically with AI. Uh, so uh, you're welcome to pass by booth 867 to see some of our stuff, what we can do, and what we can help you do with Asterisk and do far more things. Uh, also, you're welcome to leave your uh, business card to win one. We got three of these. By the way, they're not available in the US yet. We'll be available only in December. Anybody got kids? Who has kids? Little kids, around five to eight. Kids, grandkids, whatever. Okay, so this is a Nickelodeon smartwatch for kids. It's a family security communications hub. Uh, it's all powered by our platform, has a built-in eSIM. Really cool stuff. Uh, so you're welcome to pass by and talk and questions. We had a lot of them, but yeah. We probably have, we probably have time for just maybe one question at this sure. time. Or so who has a question? Who wants to hackle? You remember Rob used to put on Facebook, I'm heckling? No one. Everybody's afraid. <laughs> I'm kidding. Okay, so thank you everybody. <laughs>